Hi, this recording we're going to review understanding spectators as consumers. As we look at this idea of sport marketing, we can look at a couple of different um, ideas of, of who our client or who our consumer or who our customer may be. And we talked about spinning it a couple of times and we looked at um, participants as consumers and now we'll look at spectators as consumers. So we have to understand our consumers needs. And when we develop this idea of an effective marketing mix, we have to understand how and why the consumer enjoys that sport or likes that sport or what needs are being met by rooting for that sport. And we can look at this idea through different sociological factors and psychological factors. Sociological factors, influences of other people and other groups upon us, and psychological factors, really uh, factors that are innate to the individual. There is a relationship between playing and watching, sometimes. Some sports have a significant participant and spectator overlap. Golf, the majority of people who watch golf and go to golfing events and watch on TV are also golfers. Some sport have more spectators than actual participants like motorsports. 400,000 people go to the Indy 500 every year, yet people who have actually driven an Indy car out of that whole group probably number under a under 100. Some sport have more participants than spectators. Uh, running, you go to a running race and there's uh, at times 30, 40, 50,000 people. Um, but in terms of who's watching it on television, save for the Olympics and a casual fan, more of a nationalistic aspect, uh, very few people will sit down and watch the Boston Marathon. Some people will come out and watch on site, but that tends to be a little bit more of a communal aspect as opposed to uh, watching the sport itself. Sometimes there's overlap, sometimes there isn't. Uh, we can look at two different markets, the spectators and the participants. Uh, oftentimes they're different socioeconomic and, and spectators tend to be older. The typical paradigm of, of watching sport was this idea that you would uh, play sport as a youth and then as you get older you may coach, you may watch more uh, than actually participate. So we look at this idea that there's going to be differences between the two markets. There can be the same, it could be different. What we're looking at in terms of here, in terms of a spectator, we want to create experiences. We want to create touch points where the organization interacts and engages with that consumer in order to create a positive experience. These are also potential negative experiences. We look at products that we can have, whether we're building um, a sports equipment or we're handing out hot dogs or uh, some marketing communications or program. Uh, those are areas that we engage the consumer with a product that can either be very good, very informative, a lot of pictures, uh, and very worthwhile, or something that the customer will say, you know what, I bought a $5 program and it's just filled with ads. People, different places, whether they're our custodians or our ticket takers or our ushers or our parking attendants, we have many different places that people can touch and see and engage with our consumer, not just the coach and the players maybe at a meet and greet. Our communications, our website, um, our decks, our information, our brochures, our retail environment, the atmosphere that we create. How many merchandise tents do we have? What are we selling? Our support, whether it's customer service or a warranty, different events at the facility, whether they're the meet and greets or uh, our pick a find your seat day um, or actual game day and, and things that we do beforehand or afterwards. Maybe we have a run the bases day. Any partnerships or alliances that we have, maybe we run across uh, one of our partners or corporate sponsors where uh, they've been engaged or named in a corrupt activity. How does that impact our consumer and our reputation? Our media coverage, our giveaways, our meet and greets, all of these different places allow our uh, consumer to touch our organization and engage in our organization. Different factors influence motivation. We root for teams because we base our self-esteem on it. Um, our team wins. Our team does well. We're happy. Our team does poorly. We get angry. We base our interactions with other people, our mental and emotional health on our sport teams. 
We can look at Berging or Corfing. Berging, the Baskin reflected glory, where when our team wins, we tend to wear our team colors, our jerseys, our hats. We talk about our team more often. Maybe uh, New York Mets win a division. All of a sudden, we see more Met fans out there. Uh, Corfing is the opposite, cast off reflected failure, where our team doesn't do well. We don't show the colors as much. Um, maybe uh, Washington Nationals didn't make the playoffs. So if you're a Nationals fan, maybe don't wear your Nationals stuff. Maybe you're uh, rooting for the Redskins or the Ravens or, or some other team that may not be doing as poorly, and you start wearing that stuff. So you cast off reflected failure. Reasons why people go and watch events, it's a diversion from everyday life. Think about we get to an arena and we can watch other people. Time is different. We don't we start a game at 705 maybe, but in baseball we don't even measure time. We measure innings. In tennis, we measure games by kind of an arbitrary scoring system. 15, 30, 40, advantage, deuce. We don't we, we count up to six games for a set and then best of five or best of three sets. So we look at this everyday life. Rules are different. In hockey, we're allowed to, you know, hit people in the stomach and legs with our stick. We do that out on the street and we're arrested. We watch it because it's entertaining, because it's unpredictable, because there's a drama to it. We don't know what's going to happen. We do it for eustress reasons. It stimulates our senses. We go to an NHRA race and we smell the nitrous. We hear the loud noises from the engines. They you know, go off and they do the hot running, they do the drag racing. We feel chunks of the rubber off the tires. We get dirty, sweaty. It's amazing that we get all of this from it. Maybe watch because we gamble and we have betting interests in it. We watch sport for a purely aesthetic form, when we watch dancing or diving or ice skating, it's beautiful. Maybe we appreciate that crack of the bat and the ball arcing over the outfield wall for a home run or a beautifully tight thrown spiral as the receiver is breaking away at the last second from a defensive back to score on a bomb. There's beautiful aspects to it. We watch because we have a need for affiliation. We like to belong to different groups. We like to declare ourselves fan of the Bills or skiers or other types of askings because we want to be a part of a group. We are also influenced by our family. Maybe growing up, our, our parents were a fan of a, of a team. So we become that fan because we're indoctrinated into that area. We look at reasons to go and game attractive. Why do we go to this game? Well, the Bills Patriots is a very big rivalry and the Patriots have had some success over the past 10 years. So, and they have stars like Tom Brady. So we're going to go to that because it's attractive. Maybe we're not going to go see a Chargers or a Raiders or a Texans game. The quality of the game may create an incentive for us to go or not go depending on that individual game. Our economic factors of people going to games and attendance, generally the higher value of the game, the greater the income of the population, the greater the game attendance. Reason why New York, Chicago, Los Angeles have had high ticket prices and tend to draw very well is because they have very large populations, very large populations and very wealthy populations amongst those areas allow them to draw more and to have ticket prices at a significantly higher level than other types of teams. Remember, satisfaction equals benefits minus costs. The satisfaction we derive from these games has to create benefits that we get from it. The motivation, the output has to outweigh the cost, and those costs are not financial. We may not go to games because it's televised. The blackout rule in the NFL. Sometimes maybe a televised game creates incentive to go. It becomes a happening. Maybe we see, um, maybe we're at a smaller college, a D3 or a small D1 that's not on TV that much, and ESPN comes and, and televises it. Now it's something that we want to go to because the perceived factor of it is that it's more exciting, something to do, something interesting. We look at demographic factors like population, age, gender, education, occupation. These tend to show us different types of sport. A more higher 
educated and more wealthy uh, uh, population may include more of a country club sport, more tennis, more golf, a more blue collar may look at an NHRA or at a dirt track as opposed to NASCAR or an IndyCar or a Formula One. If you think of different socioeconomic aspects of motorsports and of other sport, you can look and see different hierarchies um, and how those brand images are directed towards different populations to attend the games. We could look at the newness of a stadium. If a stadium is new, if it's comfortable, if it's clean, are there reasons to go for the game because of the stadium? Maybe it has a Hall of Fame. Maybe it has a restaurant. Maybe it's a new stadium or it's a historical stadium like Fenway Park or Wrigley Field where we're going to go to see a game in that stadium. Ken Blanchard had the great quote that said you can really tell how an organization values its customer by how clean its bathrooms are. So you can look at cleanliness of the stadium. Here we're really looking at those costs. If it's not clean, if the seats aren't comfortable, if they're benches, if they're wood, if it's hard to get to the stadium both on and off the freeway, if the parking lots are crowded, it's more likely that we're not going to go to as many games. There has to be a reason to attract us to go to these games and to watch it. That falls under this idea of Sportscape. Sportscape is a service environment. So we look at this type of the facility and we apply service theory to it. We look at the layout, the aesthetics, the comfort, the electronic equipment, the cleanliness. What we're trying to do is influence the number of visits to the stadium and the length of the stay. Revenue equals consumption times markets. We can get people to go more often. We can get them to stay longer and spend more. The Sportscape model, we look at how easy it is to get in and out of that facility. Um, where is it? Is it near other types of things? Is parking easy? Is it well designed? Easy to get around the, the concourse? Is it easy to get from my seat to the bathroom, to the merchandise tent, to the hot dog stand, and back to my seat? I need easy and free uh, ability to do that. If we want people to go eat more hot dogs, <clears throat> we have to make that trip to buy the hot dog easier. If there's a line of you know, five people, people will look at that line and say, it's not going to be worth it. I don't want to wait in line. I'd rather go back, do without, and watch the game. So we need to analyze what we can do to lessen that line. How can we get people their hot dogs in and out quicker? Maybe we can have a mobile phone, a smart app where you can order and pay for it and then just go and pick it up. Maybe we have more hawkers in the stadium. Maybe we have people delivering it to certain areas. Maybe you're in a suite area. We have waiters and waitresses bringing the staff to you. Maybe we look at, can we build more facility? Can we do that in terms of uh, a physical structure? Or are we looking at the process? Can we get people through it quicker? Maybe they prepay and then you walk off to the side. Um, or do we need more people or better people? We'll look at seating, displays, how clean it is. That will improve perceptions about the quality of the facility. The higher the perception of the quality, the increased satisfaction, people will go longer and people will want to go more often. So stadium accessibility, we look at the availability of parking or public transportation. Can we get to the stadium easy? We look at the facility aesthetics, the appearance, the architecture, age, the walls. Is it painted? Are there nice facades? Are we putting posters up? Are we showing trophies? Are we having people in there that uh, we're honoring our former players and our championships? Can we show different aspects to it? Or is it just a cement wall? Are we given reasons why people can go in 20 minutes before game time and walk around? Maybe we have a Hall of Fame or we create the Hall of Fame in our stadium. We have people walking around. The earlier they get there, now they're going to decide to eat more there and they're not going to buy food at a local restaurant. They're going to drink more. They're going to have another soda, maybe popcorn. If we can bring the kids in, maybe we have the, the mascot inside or we have them doing things. What can we do to get them in the stadium earlier? We look at scoreboard quality and, and social media aspects now that, you know, it's becoming a very highly uh, perceived aspect of a younger generation going to games because you need to be connected. We're looking at college football stadia across the country. Student interest in going to games is bottoming out, even at 
big schools, Ohio State, Nebraska, Michigan, schools that have had no trouble in the past getting student interest are now having difficulty finding students to go. That's the next generation. You're never going to have a bigger fan of a college football program than students that go there at that point. And yet people are not going because of this inability to be connected all the time. We need to adjust to that and find these connections. Perceived crowding, seating comfort, layout accessibility. Can you move freely? Is there signage telling you where different things are? How can we create an area with the physical environment to get people more often, to get them to spend more? We can look at process. How do we get people in and out quicker? What can we do in terms of a process to make people like the stadium more? What can we put on our parking attendants? What can we put on our ushers, our custodians, our merchandise people to make things quicker, easier, more friendly? What process do we have? We can look at this idea of a process where the marketing department is an invisible aspect to it, where we're helping the physical design and the people and we're setting standards for these engagements and these interactions. The customer doesn't see the marketing department, but they engage with them. And what we need to do is make sure that we have this idea that they're available so that we have a standard. If we want people to go more often and we want them to stay longer and spend more money, we need to set standards as that marketing department. We can look at people. How can we get better people working our stadium? What can we do to guarantee their ability? We look at Disney model, perhaps, and how their people are engaged to create these situations where they're saving a, a student or child or a parent enjoyment. Do we need to take more pictures? Do we need to find unruly people or, or people that are sitting near them, maybe a family that's not having a good time? What can we do to increase their enjoyment? We need to be consistent in the service delivery because we can't guarantee a victory. The other team wants to win too. They're going to be competitive. We need to make sure that we're setting standards. We need to get people to greet our consumers. I went to a game at Notre Dame Stadium. And as I went through, the ticket taker scanned my ticket and said, welcome to Notre Dame. I've never been welcomed to a stadium before. I walked through that and thought, this experience is special because that ticket taker is setting a context that it's going to be special. And it was. It was something different. It wasn't just a game. We can look at the blueprint of the service again, where we can watch what a person does throughout the whole environment of going to a game. They arrive. In fact, we can look at it before they arrive. How did they buy their ticket? Where did they begin their travel to get to the stadium? We can look at this idea of if they purchase a program. Is that program good? Was there a line? Is it priced right? Was the person friendly selling it to them? An usher directs them to the seat. Do they go to the seat? Do they go to the bathroom? How is that uh, facility? Is it clean? Is it easy to get in and out of? Are they going to be able to go get concessions or merchandise or get their seat? How is the environment? How is the entertainment? Are they going to get up and go to the bathroom or concession stand or merchandise during the game? How is that experience? All of these different engagements we look at from a marketing perspective being invisible we need to make sure we anticipate those engagements and we set those engagements so that they're very high level so the person comes more often and they spend more money. We look at the value of a team to a community. We can look at this idea that it builds solidarity, that uh, there's social equality, that people are interacting with people that are differently. I may sit next to somebody who's a billionaire at a football game, yet during that game, all we are are fans of the same team. We're all rooting for the same thing, that in essence, there's supposed to be some sort of excitement, that there's a benefit to it. There's some commercial activity, some commercial benefit for having a professional team in your community. However, we're looking at this certainly with a lot more backlash than we had in the past, that you know, a driver of economic, a professional team really isn't when you look at the investment that it takes to build stadium. And you know, certainly the NFL has this context where – uh, taxpayers are building their facility for them at increased taxes. And, you know, for the most part, players don't stay in the cities year round, that they're 
in these communities are playing games and they're going some other place to spend the money. So an economic benefit is minimal to have these type of activities from a spectator point of view. However, when you think of a uh, extrinsic reward, it may be lacking, but an intrinsic reward. Maybe there's uh, you know, some sort of social pride. Maybe there's some sort of value in rebranding your community. Uh, you know, Atlanta, Beijing having Olympics and moving it to a world-class area and introducing your city or your country to an international market may be a value. We look at sport involvement. That interest comes in and personal importance of sport. How involved are you? The more involved somebody is, potentially the higher they are in terms of the fan aspect. Again, we're looking within a market. A person who's outside of a market and never goes to a game, you know, may be considered a fan in their mind. But as a marketer, we need to make sure we're trying to get them into our stadium sometime. And what can we do to increase our revenue from them when they're not in a market? If they are in the market and they call claim to be a big fan and they don't go to games, we need to really work on that. We can look at different fan identifications, whether they're low, medium, or high. Recommend you know watching these uh, videos. One is a Seinfeld uh, short clip. The other one's um, John Calipari talking about how identified and uh, involved the people are uh, with fan. You can be low, a social fan, a medium, where a short time, maybe a bandwagon, maybe you're interested because they're winning. Um, and of course, I say you know you because we are all yous. You know, it's not just them and they's we need to be working on. It comes down to this escalator concept. The escalator concept breaks out our users in a few different levels. One, we have these non-consumers, people who aren't involved in our organization at all. Maybe you're a non-consumer of the Philharmonic where you're not going to, uh, you know, symphonies and you're not buying any symphony shirts or music. You know, think of that from a sport context. Then we look at some indirect consumers. Maybe they'll watch a game on TV. Maybe these are the fans from outside of our town. Can we engage them a little bit more? To move non-consumers, we can't really sell them season tickets. We need to become indirect consumers first. Maybe we entice them. Maybe our team's going to the playoffs after a very long layoff, and we can start doing some more PR and getting more people involved in this you know, new excitement and get them to watch the game. Then we look at consumers, light users. They're going to a couple of games and then more games. Maybe we get a small season ticket package, a large season ticket package, heavy users. We can look at the Pareto effect where 80% of our revenue is generated by 20% of our market. That 20% are heavy users, our corporate clients, our you know people that are going to season ticket holders. What are their wants and needs? If you're going to 81 games, you're going to want different food. You're going to want better parking. If you're going to two or three games a year, I don't mind having you wait in the parking lot because I'm growing you. And hopefully you'll turn into a medium or heavy user eventually. But these are things I need to be thinking about. How do I move people up? How do I engage them? So begin thinking about these different wants and needs from a non-consumer, indirect consumer, and a light user, medium user, a heavy user. They're going to be very different in terms of what that consumer wants out of the experience.